Baseline risk assessments. Interesting topic. Well, I can tell you, I guarantee that some of you are going to walk away after this session with a wow on your mind. I didn't know that. I didn't think that. I didn't know it involved that. And that's what we want to try and do is share that with you. What we're going to do, I'm going to throw a few slides, then we'll have a panel discussion, and then at the end, I'm going to run through a few more slides to give you a practical example. Okay, here's the first question. What constitutes a baseline risk assessment for clients intended um, construction projects? We have here the man I affectionately call Pumi, sitting at the far side from the Department of Labor. Next to him is Rob Jack, uh, Atkins. And then on this side, I don't, never know him by his long name. I just call him Tumi, and I'm just Leighton. <laughs> so just that you know who the panel are and who the people actually are. Right. The first thing that we would actually start out, the Construction Regulation 9, this is the Construction Regulations of 2014, prescribes performing a contractor's risk assessment related to the construction work, the health and hazard exposures. Now, that's the one that all the contractors know about. That's what they write in their health and safety plans, etc. It is basically a job task risk assessment, often called a hazard identification and risk assessment. But the Occupational Health and Safety Act and the construction regulation do not or does not define what a baseline risk assessment is. It defines what the 9-1 is, but it doesn't define what a baseline risk assessment is. This, I think, has led to a lot of confusion in the industry, and guys just don't understand it. They can't see the difference between them. And I'm, we are going to share that difference and let you know about it. If we go and look at the construction regulation 51A, this prescribes performing a client's baseline risk assessment for the intended construction work project. So my question is, what makes a client's baseline risk assessment different from the 91 a, the contractor's one. Okay, already I can see the wheels going in the head. What? I didn't know there was a difference. But just to make it even more confusing, the South African Qualifications Authority has a registered unit standard to conduct a baseline risk assessment and take appropriate action. And when you look at the small type, what's involved, it doesn't help us either. You, whoever's doing the training course has got to explain specific requirements prepare baseline risk assessment, conduct it, and then it conf gets confused. Initiate redeeming actions for hazard identified and risk assessment. All right. Peng Hun, are we, are we going back to the HIRA? So there's a lot of confusion here. So guess what? Let us try and explain that. Um, I don't know who would like to start. Pumi, would you like to start? Or <laughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Pumuzo Mapaha. You, you caught me off guard a little bit there, Leighton. Um, how many minutes do I have? Five, five minutes for me, it will be fine. Yes. Um, you know, in, in this industry, I, I feel like this other man that I read on this other book. But this man, they say, I, I'm not sure about it. He changed water into wine. And then later on, the very same people that he changed water into wine, they, they crucified him. I didn't understand because he made them wine. But then, then instead of these people fighting Pilate, who's the client, they, they fight this one who changed water into wine. Why am I saying that? Uh, I know that you are going to crucify me. One, we did not define a base, uh, baseline risk assessment in the regulations. And uh, again, we don't even have it on the act. And when you look into it, you'll realize that we should have been having this. But what um, I want to tell you is that as a legislature, we are in the process of collapsing the facilities regulation, the environmental regulation, and the general safety regulation they are going to be called general health and safety regulations so that we can define some of these 
a, a, a generic term like baseline risk assessment because it's applicable not only in the construction industry but also in other areas as well. By not having these definitions in other regulations, we find people who are cleaning windows today saying that they are doing construction work because they are working on heights. So we are trying to address such issues and baseline risk, uh, risk assessment is one of them. But now, what I want to put now on the floor, which is what you will be crucifying me for, uh, and I'm saying maybe I'm not the one to crucify, let's rather all change our focus and look at our pilot, the client, myself and you. I'm a regulator, you are a professional. Let's look at the client. The big question that I have late in today is, when do we conduct baseline risk assessment? I understand the what it is is still a question mark, but when do we conduct it? Because nine out of 10 agents, when they get appointed, design stages already passed, way after the baseline risk assessment is needed. In fact, when you produce a baseline risk assessment it's because they want a permit from the Department of Labor, the construction permit. I am unable to enforce it with inspectors currently because it is extremely difficult. How do we deal with the client, the pilot, before you crucify me in, in government? I, I want you to help me with ideas on that one because more often you are contacted and be told that tomorrow go to DOL to apply for the permit. I think that is the only question that will satisfy me if I can uh, get some response uh, later. Thank you. Thanks, Pomi. Tommy, you can pick it up. All right. Uh, afternoon, delegates. Hope none of us are asleep. Um, I'll try to be more energetic. Um, can I please, uh, can I have a, maybe just as a joke, a bone of contention with whoever wrote my profile on the magazine. They clearly said I was unmarried, so uh, if we can just change that profile. I am getting married soon, so please, we can just change it now. <laughs> All right. Um, I, I think Mr. Uh, Pumi has raised the thorny issue, and I do appreciate the fact that um, all of us sitting here will come up with something more practical, you know, in terms of what a baseline is, you know, but uh, I think delegates, we need to start with fundamentals. Uh, I think a lot of you sitting here cannot even clearly define the difference between a health and safety agent, a health and safety manager, and a health and safety officer. So before we get too entangled, you know, in terms of trying to identify what a baseline is. I think we, we just need to understand that a health and safety agent, the PR, professionally registered, is there to manage and support the client. You know, so he or she is directly hired by the client. Typically, a registered manager and an officer are hired by the contractor now during stage five. So if we can just clear that, that does not mean that a client may not necessarily appoint a registered manager. Of course, it will depend on the complexities and so forth. All right, um, in terms of a baseline, I think Mr. Mapa raised an important question. Where should it start? I mean, if you look at our scope of services as, as professionals, it's, it, it clearly prescribes that uh, we need to include a baseline risk assessment at, at stage two, which is now concept and feasibility as a draft. So I think that, that that's where we need to start. But <laughs> there's no way we can start at that level if we are only being appointed at stage five or stage six. You see, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy that there's a lot of clients here. I'm seeing a lot of my clients here and, and I know you still owe me about six months of fees, so I'll definitely <laughs> remind you around that. But in terms of appointing health and safety agents early, you know, it's, it's of significant importance so that we can come in. So coming in at stage two or preferably at stage one gives us now the armor, you know, and, 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 and gives us the muscle to, 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 to take this forward. But now what is freaky, and I think Rob will elaborate on this, is that doing a baseline is one thing, but who does the health and safety agent conduct this baseline with? 
Personally, I've tried speaking to a lot of my professional teams, engineers, architects, to set up a meeting to say, guys, let's all come together. Let's try now, you know, identify. Let's do a survey of possible risks on this project. And they're, none to, they're nowhere to be found. You know, so it is quite depressing and sad finding that you end up doing that work by yourself or with your team, you know, which is, which is not the in, uh, intended case. You know, so we can all agree that it has to be done at stage two. And I like what, um, uh, what a former colleague of mine said here. When we approach some of these things, we need to keep them very simple. You know, so I think if you look at the, the nine knowledge areas, you know, procurement, cost, hire, you can honestly run your baseline risk assessment based on all those nine knowledge areas. You know, and I know Leighton is a big fan of pep mouth, which I love as well. You know, people, equipment, processes, you know, uh, money, environment. You can also run your, your baseline risk assessment based on those seven critical resources. Thank you. Thanks, Jimmy. Um, thanks, Rob. Thanks, Leighton. Thanks, Pumi. Uh, baseline risk assessments are always a bit of a bugbear in the industry. Most of the clients do not understand why you need them. In fact, during the previous session, I had to walk out to take a call from an architect who I've done work with before and says, he's got a 10 million rand project. Does he need a baseline risk assessment? Um, and this is a qualified, registered architect. And he's not the first one. It happens quite often. It is a challenge because we end up working in a silo, and this is what the theme has been all throughout the day, that we end up doing work in a silo rather than as a team. However, there are some clients out there, I'm not gonna mention clients' names, um, that want to get involved. In fact, they insist, one of the large state-owned companies, if you haven't done your original risk workshop, then you move to a baseline risk assessment, you do not pass go. The project goes nowhere until those gates are opened. And that is really the way a project should be managed and should be run. What normally goes into a baseline risk assessment, you might ask, that's so critical. Well, it gives you an insight as to what could go wrong with the project. It also is there to give the contractor guidance when he's tendering to what you have sat with the design team and identified in terms of risks and hazards and what you have seen during your site visits. Once you have done this, the contractor can now sit and read this risk assessment, which then leads you into your health and safety specification, and start budgeting correctly. But that's not to say it does happen, because I can tell you now, the contractor looks at this document and says, we'll budget like we normally do, fixed amount for safety for two years. And I've got a client, I've got a contractor with that problem now. Two-year project, he's got a 30,000 rand budget for safety. And when we go to apply for permit, I say, sorry, that's not going to cut it. I want a detailed budget. And they don't want to give it to you because then they think they're going to get committed to it. And yes, they are going to get committed to it. So the contractors also need to be educated in the use of a baseline and of the specification. Thank you, ladies. So, but Nathan, uh, uh, Leighton, I don't think we, we, we've touched on your question that what is the thorough difference between a, a baseline risk assessment and a, a, and a contractor's risk assessment. I think, I think we need to tabulate the fact that, you know, at stage two when we are drafting, that is precisely intended for the project consulting team. You know, I, I think we need to thoroughly emphasize on that. And when we do now the final baseline risk assessment at stage three, you know, during design and development, then that is now intended now for tendering and procurement purposes. So now that will be completely different to now what the contractor will now be doing in stage five. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you. I think this is the major issue that in any project, what is it? And I'm going to go, go, go take you through some slides, but I'm wondering if there's any comment from the audience. Any questions at this moment in time? Thanks. Um, just a just a point of view in terms of of what Tumi said around the um, around the baseline risk assessment, and specifically in terms of Regulation Five One A and B, which talks specifically that in uh, stages one and two of the contract. Because if I'm correct, Pumi, 
The critical thing is, is that the design team needs to be given a baseline risk assessment and a um, health and safety specification to guide the design <coughs> to try and um, through um, elimination, et cetera, to look at a hierarchical approach to, to eliminating risk. So um, that's a critical issue. So the design team will not be doing their, their job correctly um, or at least have the correct amount of guidance if they don't have a um, health and safety agent at that level who can do that level of health and safety um, baseline risk assessment. Um, it, you know, it's a high level risk assessment. It could be a risk register, um, but it should guide because the client always knows at that point in time, colleagues, what the concept design is going to be or what that contract would be. Otherwise, they would have never gone to Treasury to get the funding for it. So at that point in time, by the time stage one starts, or stage two starts, the, the, the contract value is approximately known. There is funding for that project. So why there is not um, adequate, there's no excuse, in fact, for any client not to have a baseline risk assessment done or the appointment at that point in time. And that, that's my feeling, um, colleagues, and I don't know if you agree with me or not. Claire, I certainly I agree, agree with, with you. you. Any other question, comment? Yes, there's one up here. Um, thank you. Uh, excuse my lack of knowledge. I just wanted to understand because um, we seem to be focusing right now on um, risk assessment that is related to health and safety. So I just wanted to check, just to understand, test my understanding, because when you say baseline risk assessment, because I'm not necessarily focusing on one aspect, um, I'm thinking overall risk assessment, because you've got a, a lot of risks that are outside the scope of health and safety. So I just wanted to understand what are we really, uh, talking about? Is it risk that only relates to health and safety, or is it risk that will might uh, affect the project in general? You yeah, and actually, in fact, you are correct in what you're saying. We, in the baseline risk assessment, we cover all the risks related to the project work that's going to be done. And the project work is design, it's the engineering, the throwing the concrete, the reinforcing, everything that you do to um, working at heights, et cetera. So all those issues will come into get in that because we're talking about the total project from a helicopter view. Uh, Prof. John? Someone else will. Okay. Yes, I think just, just to provide a perspective because not everyone that is attending this session is necessarily um, focused on, on health and safety. My view is that a baseline risk assessment is a project environment related hazard identification and risk assessment. The 42 degree temperatures in the Karoo, the lightning strikes while undertaking the construction of Madupi Power Station, the 130 kilometer per hour wind recorded during the construction of the upper aerial cableway station on top of Table Mountain in 1997, also the lowest air temperature, including wind chill, which was minus 12 degrees. The crocodiles gravitating around the estuary over which you are building a bridge. The landmines that remain from the war in Angola beneath the approach road to the bridge in southern Angola, which you are undertaking repairs to. If you're working in the London Docklands, unexploded ordnance dropped from Heinkel, HE-111 German bombers when you start, um, what's the word, inserting piles or driving piles. So those are some of the key bra items that should be identified during a baseline risk assessment. Design hire is a different. Hazards and risk that arise from the design. Construction hire is hazards and risk that arise from the construction process. So a hazardous chemical substance is a design originated hazard and risk. It's not actually a construction originated hazard and risk. Thanks, oh, there's another question over here. Uh, program director, hello. There was also one at the back here. 
Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, mine is uh, less of a question than uh, more and more of a, a request for, for clarity or articulation. Um, within the um, Health and Safety Act, there's, uh, my understanding is that there's three primary role players. There's a client, as in the employer. There's the uh, agents appointed by the employer within the design uh, leg or, or, or process. And then there's the, um, the health and safety professional. I assume that's an officer at the, that would be appointed by the contractor. So essentially there's an employer, there's an employer's agents, and there's a contractor. And it's just to understand when and what are the uh, different roles and responsibilities. Uh, because that's a part that then I uh, understand leads to applications that would be um, made or, or, or submitted to the Department of Labor. I think I should respond immediately on this one. Our expectation is that the client, a client will have a team. It can be project managers, engineers, and whoever. In that team, the client needs to have a construction health and safety agent. And it is the responsibility of that construction health and safety agent to produce the baseline risk assessment that addresses issues of health and safety. Other people can bring in into that baseline risk assessment uh, issues related to what they do. But what we find more often is that the construction health and safety agent is nowhere at that time. Is only uh, hired at the end when a permit is needed. You talked about the construction health and safety officer. That one, our expectation is that he's appointed by the contractor. So here when we are talking the agent, we are talking to the client. So we should just separate those two issues. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Leiden. Um, I was just going to respond a little bit towards the uh, <laughs> the prof uh, John John's uh, uh, comments and uh, how broad they are, but they actually go broader than that, I think, because you also have societal impacts. You have people that are working in the area that are impacted by the construction, not, and all those risks should also be taken into account because it affects the bottom line at the end. Thank, thanks very much on that. Yeah, I think that those are the very important points. And Leighton. As I said, I need a few. Is there another one? Yes. Uh, is there a uh, mic up there somewhere? He's got a yes. Take, take it. On. Oh, okay. Um, I let me stand up. I, I'd like to make a comment around uh, when should baseline risk assessments be done. Yes, ideally it's uh, stage two, but I represent a client. The challenge that we've brought upon ourselves as clients is we only appoint PRs, uh, CHSA, when there is a permit required. There is this notion that you only need an agent uh, when a permit is required. But when you look at the deliverables, the only people really who can do, execute deliverables for stage one up to four is the agent. But we forgo that one. We only appoint agents when we require a permit. Hence, the late uh, appointment of agents because the award amount came in at 40.1 million. Then we say, oops, we need an agent. If together sitting here, we can try and arrest that and enforce that an agent is required from uh, inception. Thanks. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I know we're getting a few more questions, so we might run a little bit longer in time, but uh, I think it's important. Yeah, okay, can I just quickly uh, go There was in another there. one up there somewhere? No. Was it here? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Name is Frank. Uh, I just wanted to go back to really looking at the, the pilot and the, the wine uh, maker. Uh, I, I tend to feel that uh, in this country, we're not really, really, really very hard on clients and designers. These are the two people that have always been dancing together and, and there's, no, there's not much. If you look at the construction regulation, six is very clear. And if you look at section 10 
of the Act of 1993 is very explicit, that the design has got certain responsibilities. And uh, in my whole time that I've spent in construction, I rarely see somebody coming from the Department of Labor walking into the designer's office and looking at certain compliance areas or perhaps even asking about the designers. Neither do they even walk into the office of the RE on construction side. Now the question is I, either they, they don't know or they are scared. We need to fix that space and very, very urgently because all what is written there in Regulation 6 is very, very clear what the designer must do. So, but coming to the client, the client is also very loose in this country. We need to put our foot on the ground. But perhaps it could be because of the way health and safety is actually put into the constitution of this country. The word safety is there, the word occupation is there, health, health is there, but it's not actually as one concept as occupational health and safety. So, you know, when you look at health, it's defined based on what the health, World Health Organization is saying, and then safety is something else there. So, I, I tend to think that probably is, it could be one of the reasons why uh, the clients are very, very loose. Maybe we need to get a little bit more prescriptive things. Yeah, uh, just a quick comment to my first one, but I think for me it needs answered properly. The issue is, is that the clients don't know the Occupational Health and Safety Act. They don't know the construction regulations. 90% of your clients are financial people or engineers in senior management positions. And safety and health is an unknown territory to them. So they hand it in the industry, they'll hand it to some junior who doesn't have the power to actually change anything. And this is the issue. We've got to educate our senior management in business in companies, in construction, that this legislation is there. And it needs to be, so it's an education issue of our management team. And then once they start realizing there is the legislation, then our friend Pumi there will come up with the answers. <laughs> the reason why later I started by using that uh, a analogy of the man with the wine and those that he made wines for they crucified him is because what I'm going to say now, closing, it will make you to want to crucify me. You see, the, the problem is, Leighton, we've got our health and safety professionals who have no choice, because it's work, but to accept their project, even when it's far beyond the time that they should have been accepted. But having done that, they will never come to the department and say, by the way, on that project, I was only informed two weeks ago about it because they want to maintain this healthy relationship. Now, what happens now, me and you, we start fighting. Pilot, the client is not there because I need to give you a permit, but I can clearly see that you were not involved at the beginning stages, at the initial stages of, of, of the design. If you read construction regulations 5.1a, it means the very first part. It says, a client must prepare a baseline risk assessment for an intended construction work project. The, the, the issue of, that we are talking about today of a baseline risk assessment, it squarely belongs to the client. And, and we shouldn't be fighting about it because I can tell you there are a lot of uh, permits that we are not finishing them within 30 days because the baseline risk assessment, you can actually see that it was produced after a lot of things were done. When you ask the person, so this uh, 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 project is in Cape Town. Yes, have you been to the area where it's being built? I'm asking an agent now. An agent said, look, they only told me two weeks ago. So you, you haven't applied your mind. Me and you, we start fighting now and you want to crucify me. 